Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, please be sure to like, share and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. So I wanted to do a quick video. Uh, if, if you're new to this channel, uh, I am a writer, I'm a creator, I'm a filmmaker, and I have a lot of projects uh, ongoing. If you go to my Patreon, uh, which is Pip Says, Pip Says on Patreon, you'll see some of my projects uh, in play, some of our merch. Uh, stay tuned. We're getting a lot of that rolling, uh, working about 16 hours a day. So, so you're going to see a lot of developments there. Anyways, today's topic is, let's get into it, the deus ex machina plot device. Uh, deus ex machina is a Latin term that means the god from the machine. Uh, and, and basically in this context, uh, I have the Studio Blinder uh, video up. I thought this was pretty intriguing that they would go over this uh, because the, the deus ex machina is frowned upon as a plot device. And what I wanted to do was to uh, put my own spin on this, of course, which, uh, which is uh, going to be a little bit different, which is the uh, Diaboli uh, ex machina, Diaboli ex machina, which is the devil from the machine. Uh, and we'll go into that in a minute. So let's go ahead and look at first what this concept is. Today, our subject is the Deus Ex Machina. Let's examine the common types and tropes associated with this plot device and explore ways screenwriters can avoid this trap. This is What is Deus Ex Machina? The hero is trapped facing certain death with no possible way to win until something or someone intervenes at the last possible minute. A deus ex machina is when a seemingly unsolvable problem is conveniently and unrealistically resolved. And most writers agree that plot devices like this should be avoided at all costs. A great one. Okay, so let's pause right there. Yeah, so there, there's a lot, and you'll you'll see in a lot of um, older films, especially uh, the Deus Ex Machina, which is the God from the Machine comes in and saves the day, and uh, basically that that is a manifestation of uh, just this really powerful something or other. And you've seen it. I mean, I've seen it in Game of Thrones. Even if if you watch the Battle of the Bastards, they have a Deus Ex Machina in that uh, episode, and, and I mean, it's, uh, it plays well, but, and it, it is satisfying. However, the, the thing that makes that satisfying is the sacrifice um, in that piece. So the sacrifice at the beginning, uh, the fact that they are going through uh, a hellish time is, is really well done. So let's let's uh, explore this just a little bit more. I don't want to take too much of their content here. A supreme being. But is the Deus Ex Machina really so bad? Well, let's find out then, shall we? Also, fair warning, we will be spoiling the following movies. Yeah, spoiler alert. Matrix, Avengers, you know. Deus Ex great. Machina is a Latin phrase that translates directly as God from the machine, and it originated in ancient Greek theater. In these plays, the this God from the machine was quite literal. Tragedies were frequently resolved by a God oh. swooping in to save the day. Okay, that's good. That's enough to give us context. So uh, the God comes in and saves the day. Now, uh, the premise that I wanted to explore uh, obviously, there's there's a lot of examples of this that um, that you can look at, and what I wanted to explore is the Diaboli, uh, Diaboli ex machina, which is the devil from the machine, and that's a different concept. So the devil from the machine would be obviously the opposite of the Deus ex machina, and as a writer, so when you flip this, you know the Obviously, everybody feels like it's cheap when you introduce uh, a god from the machine conveniently at the last minute to save the hero. And um, so essentially what we're going to do is 
introduce a concept called uh, the diaboli from the machine, which is a Latin phrase for the devil from the machine saying, uh, what if the devil or the antagonist has a final uh, showing, you know, at the very end of the story. So as you think of examples of this, what, what would that mean? Uh, the movie Seven would be a great example of uh, the Diaboli from the machine or the Diaboli ex machina rather. Uh, the movie Seven, the, the film, The Usual Suspects. The Usual Suspects is quite literally an example of that uh, premise. So, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, your film doesn't necessarily have to end with this great um, savior, you know. And sometimes, you know, one, one of the things we've really lost in modern society is teaching people a lesson. You have people that, that go off the rails and uh, especially when you look at fairy tales, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Grimm, the Brothers Grimm stories, uh, the original Brothers Grimm fairy tales were very dark, and it was meant to teach you a lesson. So the fairy tales were for children to learn uh, morality, and we've lost that in a lot of respects because we, you know, we've candy coated so many things. And so when you look at it and you say, um, you know, I'm I'm on a plane and someone is being very annoying. They're taking their shoes off. They're rubbing their gold toe socks together as Bill Burr describes in a lot of his um, rhetoric and a lot of his shows, which I can envision that because I've actually seen those people who get a little too comfortable out in public. Um, where do those people come from? You know, uh, so as a storyteller, we're looking at our responsibility, not only to serving the audience, but also to shaping the audience. You know, it, it's, we have, um, a, a compulsory obligation to help society to better themselves, right? And if you're doing a deus ex machina, you're not really serving that purpose. Uh, however, it is, it's good. It's good. It's nice to have a satisfying ending. I happen to have a story. Uh, so if you look at my stories currently on Wattpad, uh, I can just bring this over for a second. These are the stories that I have on Wattpad right now. And uh, basically this, this one power, this is a, this is a Diaboli uh, Ex Machina story. This is also a, a Diaboli Ex Machina story. And then this is a Deus Ex Machina story. And I mean, you really, it, it's kind of hard to not go one way or the other, right? Because you're, you're reaching a climactic resolution. Um, and you're competing with other stories, those stories are, are going to take things up to uh, a certain level. So it's difficult as a writer or a filmmaker to say, well, I'm not going to approach this ledge when everybody else is, is approaching it or going over it. Um, and there, there is something to be said for subtlety. So uh, as we talk about the Diaboli ex machina, what what is the power of that and i'm not going to give away the ending of you know power and a life exclusive those are going to come out you know probably about winter it, it is it is a very striking it is a very shocking ending but whether it's the deus ex machina or the diaboli ex machina you have to prepare your reader or your audience members for that so as they describe in the studio binder video which i'm not going to play more of that because i don't want to you know i don't want to feature too much of their content they worked really hard on it um, so Studio Binder is saying, what, uh, what can we do in terms of setting up the Deus Ex Machina? What can we do? Let's play fair with our audience. So number one, when you're setting up, whether it's the Diaboli Ex Machina or the Deus Ex Machina, set it up in a way that your audience can see it coming. You have to give them a certain amount of knowledge. Um, you have to explain what's happening. And I've, I made this mistake before. There's a there's a story I wrote called uh, "Shots Fired in the Melting Pot." It was extraordinarily powerful. And then right at the end, I had a twist, but I had not prepared my readers. I had not prepared my audience for the fact that the that the protagonist was going to switch to the antagonist. Now, 
if I put in some plot devices and I had shown them some dark secrets that this person had, or I had shown them, you know, it wouldn't have taken much. It would have taken maybe two or three uh, really strong pieces to, to lead the audience in that direction. And then they would have went with me. They would have went with me at the, you know, the end of that story. But it was just when they say, hey, you didn't, you didn't land the ending. Usually what they mean by that isn't so much that you had a bad ending. It's that you did not, you didn't bring them around to the ending properly. You were not disciplined in the way that you educated the audience in the story. You cheated them out of the ending because you did not include them in details that would have, would have taken them there, right? So you can't keep all your cards on the table as a storyteller. You really just can't um, hold things back. So I'm gonna go into a deeper level analysis. You know, this video, you know, the, the full length video here is gonna be on Patreon, but um, I'm gonna get into the Diaboli Ex Machina. I'm gonna talk about how I execute it now. I've been studying story structure for five years. Prior to that, I was studying writing for five years. Uh, so I've been studying writing for a total of, of 10 years and I've been my own editor. Um, I've, I've edited over 3000 words and um, obviously published multiple works, audiobooks, you name it. So I, I have a lot of background in the industry. I have my, my battle wounds. Uh, if somebody said, what, what is it like to publish a book? I would say it's like installing a brand new toilet in a public restroom. The, when you first get it installed, it's nice and bright and shiny and clean. And then you look at it and you're happy. And uh, the bathroom looks good and it's pristine. And then you open the bathroom to the public and they do to that toilet what they're going to do to it. <laughs> and um, you, you are not going to get away from the public doing what they're going to do to that toilet. They're going to treat your work uh, just like a toilet. So just keep that in mind. Some people will be very respectful of it. Um, and then some people will just go all out and try to make a big mess. But you need to not worry about that. You know, just admire it. Uh, once, once you release it to the public, it belongs to the public. Obviously, you own the copyright. But the, the ability to criticize, the ability to pick it apart, that all belongs to the public. And, and when you give yourself over to that process, and realize what it really means to publish a work, then you can start to, you know, adapt uh, and be a lot stronger in the way that you execute. So uh, anyways, two things that you need to know for the Deus Ex Machina and the Diaboli Ex Machina. First off, again, make sure that your reader or audience member can follow along, make sure that you give them breadcrumbs. Be fair. You don't have to disclose everything, but be fair in basically what you are uh, disclosing because that's that's what the audience expects. So, uh, and then secondly, uh, I'm just sorry. I'm just gonna have to pause for one second here and grab a drink. All right, thank you for that. So basically, what we're talking about is saying, okay, let's let's lead them into it. So, what what could I have done in shots fired in the melting pot? In Shots Fired in the Melting Pot, <clears throat> I turned the protagonist into the antagonist. So I could have led into that, and, and I would say it's the rule of threes, where there's going to be three things that would allude to the relationship, um, because at the end of the story, you find out that the producers of the, of the reality show, the, the story is based on a reality show, the producers of the reality show actually... Uh, our former uh, CIA operatives, and basically they are um, almost like a terrorist group. And they, uh, one of their operatives is the star of the show. So <clears throat> establishing first off, uh, I could have something very subtle where the group is walking along and something happens that startles the group. And then these two individuals react in a way that's very professional and profound and everyone kind of realizes that something's off right so i don't have to reveal everything but you know you know that these two folks they're not normal they they're trained um 
first off, so I've revealed that. Secondly, my protagonist uh, being in cahoots with them needs to be revealed. So all I would have to do for that is some secret meetings. So showing her having secret meetings for them in, in odd places and having other characters. And, and even to heighten that, you could have the other characters go through something pretty significant just in order to see those meetings taking place. So again, you get this Tears of the Sun type of, of buildup in which a character has to go through hell to, you know, to gain knowledge and to see the, um, and to see basically uh, providence uh, in, in front of them. So <clears throat> what, what would be the meeting place? Something exotic, you know, maybe a, um, an upscale place, really high up in a tower, whatever, whatever's going to be really uh, amazing. You know, you have, if you think about, uh, I, I believe it's Las Vegas that has that restaurant where they have, you have dinner in the sky and you're at a table, you're strapped in, but your feet are just dangling over space for hundreds of feet. That is a beautiful setting for a novel, for a film. Uh, and also, you know, for our protagonist um, to find out what's going on with these people, to find out that these people are meeting. How, how would they be able to find out um, what's going on up there. You know, they'd have to have some kind of um, optics. They'd have to have some kind of uh, telescope. They'd have to get a hold of some binoculars, something to, to see that these three people are meeting, you know, in secret. And then, um, and then to understand, you know, the devious nature of it. So you could have the, the secret meeting, you could bring the reader in, you know, the protagonist sees the meeting that's going on, and then the reader, um, you know, gets to listen in to, to what's happening. And then the protagonist, maybe, maybe they had put a, a microphone on one of their pieces of equipment. Um, who knows? But these people work for the CIA. You've got to think of that. Uh, so it's very important to, that, that all of your characters are intelligent. Uh, if you want to serve your readers, if you want to serve your audience, every character in your story needs to be intelligent. Even if you think about, you know, um, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump was taking uh, intelligent action even, even though he wasn't a bright person on the surface, he took intelligent action. You know, he took action that led to the formation of that shrimp corporation. You know, clearly, uh, yeah, he, he foolishly went out and was able to, to capture the shrimp like a fool. So he, he acted the fool as per his role, but he was wise enough to expedite the, the sale of those shrimp and to build a successful business. So the great thing is, you know, looking at that and saying, is he, is he really a fool? Was he ever really a fool? I mean, if his life was that amazing, sure. You know, he had some surface level things that he didn't understand well, but, you know, he's someone who, through his determination, um, was able to achieve ends, which a lot of people can't do. A lot of people, you know, 40, 50% smarter than him couldn't do because they're not as, as determined. They're not as um, strong in their friendships. And, you know, people like Captain Dan and such love him. And that's where you get that, that beautiful story. So the Diaboli Ex Machina, um, again, you know, establishing basically the, the what's happening, giving the reader enough breadcrumbs to follow. And then at the end, you need some kind of a sacrifice. So for the Deus Ex Machina, there has to be a sacrifice. Commonly with me and my stories, I'll have a character loses an eye or Empire Strikes Back is a really good example. Luke Skywalker loses his hand. Um, there is a sacrifice. There is a pound of flesh. That's quite literally a pound of flesh. But that, that's what you really want to get to with your, with your story, is everything significant requires sacrifice. What is my character going to have to lose to get to this level? 
that should always be the rule book that you're playing with. And again, in these stories, uh, I am exhibiting that quite a bit. Uh, I do have, there's a character in this, in this uh, story that loses his eye at the very end. Um, and I'm not trying to be bi uh, biblical with it. People will read into it as a, as a biblical reference. Uh, for me, it was just a, a physics question of, you know, the character is traveling at a high speed. He's hanging off the side of a vehicle. And he's going into um, kind of a forest area or, or an area with, with quite a few trees. So logically, I said, he's probably going to lose an eye in that situation. I mean, they slow the vehicle down, obviously, to the point where everyone can survive. He's going to have some broken bones. He's going to lose an eye. Um, he's going to, you know, his skin's going to get ripped up pretty good. He's, you know, if he hits into the tree trunks and such. But they're going to have to slow down probably in the 20 mile an hour range. And then as he flies off the vehicle, um, that's enough realistically for him to survive. And you, you really need to get in and, and understand the physics of things and what, what the human body, you know, can take. And Mythbusters is a great way um, to learn those things, to understand 100% what's going on with physics and, and things like terminal velocity. Now, the topic of the video, the devil from the machine, uh, Diablo ex machina, uh, Diaboli, excuse me, Diaboli ex machina. So how do you have a good devil from the machine? The relationship needs to be very personal, you know? Uh, just as where, you know, the, the Here's the funny thing. When you have a deus ex machina in the relationship, it's very personal. It makes it corny. But when you have a diaboli ex machina and the relationship is very personal, it makes it very powerful. You know, a, a mother and son, that's, that's the diaboli ex machina in this story is a mother and son. Um, you know, in this story, uh, basically we have a, um, a husband and wife. And so making those relationships between the devil and the protagonist, very personal. Um, and, and having it be very shocking, very shocking to the character. However, understandable. You know, the consequences, the stakes need to be such that it makes sense for the characters to make these decisions. Um, certainly a character to become the devil, they need to have a certain amount of weakness and to be able to give into that weakness. But you're going to have a, a much more powerful ending in that regard. So I would encourage you to watch uh, The Usual Suspects. Watch how they lead it out, right? Watch the breadcrumbs. Pay attention to the breadcrumbs that they give you. The Usual Suspects and Seven and pay attention to those breadcrumbs and then the diaboli ex machina at the end the devil from the machine um is a very strong way to end a story now one other way to do it is to say i'm going to bring uh the diaboli ex machina with the deus ex machina and i'm going to bring those in succession uh i'm not a big fan of that i like one or the other I don't, I don't like to have a deus ex machina and a diaboli ex machina in the same story. First of all, the odds of that are astronomically low. Secondly, the reader's going to feel cheated because you're, you know, you're shell shocking them um, with, with the movement of the story and you really should keep it in one direction. So Anyways, that's all I have for this episode. Watch for other videos on, you know, storytelling and the arts and looking forward to, uh, to you joining me on this journey. Thank you. Bye.